And when you put the whole story together, uh, the analysts like you, the analysts, analyst reports uh, uh, that just come out as a result of your first year results uh, are generally very positive. Is holding the share price one of your goals? Actually, uh, returns is one of my goals. So I'm less bothered about the share price as a measure of success. I am bothered about returns. So there's reason for our share price being where it is or our price to book being where it is. And that's because we have underperformed from a return standpoint. Uh, and therefore, when you say, you know, your share price is holding or what, the reason is that the market needs to be convinced that we have the capacity to produce returns on a sustainable uh, long-term basis. But are you spending enough so, time with your anchor investors, your, your institutional investors? Um, is there buy-in at that front or do you think there's some work to be done um, you know, to, to get, a, get them on board in terms of where you're taking the bank? I, I, I spend enough time with the investor base, uh, with our institutional investors. I think there's a high degree of confidence in terms of where we are going. I think part of the thing the investors struggle with is where we are in the industry cycle. Uh, the truth is, everybody recognizes that DBS uh, faces significant headwinds in low interest rate environments. That's just the nature of the balance sheet that I told you about, you know, the $50 billion. That's a problem which while we're addressing it, we know how to go about it. It's a 5-10 year journey. You can't wave a magic wand and say balance sheet problem fixed. So everybody knows that our $50 billion earns very little in low interest rate environments and it starts earning a significant buck when rates rise. So now that you're bringing the house in order as an organic business, um, you know, the way regional businesses are going today and international businesses are going today, um, you can keep your house in order and still lose the war. Uh, and that's because of, you know, very uh, strong global themes that are driving the industry. Um, you can't grow any much further quickly unless you made a major acquisition somewhere uh, or you made a, a fundamental shift in, your, in the strategy of your business, uh, which you already are by moving more towards fee-based businesses and so on. Um, give us some big wins that you need to make in order to take this organization to another level. Yeah, but you know, here's the thing. We, we, do, we, we want to be a major Asian uh, player. And I do believe that we have the capacity to do it in substantial measure through organic growth. I don't believe that the only way to produce an efficient, effective banking business is to go and buy something. Right? I think you can make a top line. I come from a bank which in Asia has not, ex Korea, has not made a single acquisition. Right? And it grows very nicely. It grows organically. It grows year after year by retaining a 3 to 5% market share in country after country. It's a fantastic franchise. So what's wrong with a 3-5% market share franchise in a series of countries growing one and a half times GDP? It's actually a very good business model. There's nothing wrong with that. But right in front of you, there are two pretty girls sitting uh, that are asking for attention. Uh, you have Danamon Bank in, in Indonesia. And the, the, the question in the marketplace is that if, you, if DBS needs to you know, in, increase its uh, asset base substantially, um, that would be a natural acquisition. Um, there is OCBC in Singapore. So, you know, I look at all uh, options and all questions, but I'm a firm believer, Emmanuel, unlike, uh, you know, most commentators, perhaps yourself, I don't believe adding assets is the recipe to running a successful bank. So it's, oh my God, there are a lot of assets, let's go get them, so what? Right? What does that do for you? So I think running a successful bank is being able to make sure you're positioned well and drive good uh, shareholder returns. So to me, whether it's a bank in Indonesia or a bank in Singapore, it makes sense to do only if you can figure at some value, at the right price, it is going to be accretive and going to position you well for the shareholder. Okay, let me put so. it to you another way. If your board came to you and said, uh, we, it's time to you know, take it to the next level and look at these acquisitions, uh, would you resist them? Would you play along with them? Or would you uh, give them a, an alternative uh, a view? Well, I've always said that for me, to an acquisition strategy must, on any acquisition, must satisfy three conditions for us. Number one, it should be aligned to our strategy. So the board came and told me, this is a fantastic acquisition, let's go buy a bank in the US. I'd say I'm not doing it because it's not aligned to my strategy, right? So it's got to be aligned to my, so if somebody came and told me, let's go buy this whole asset management company in Asia, it's your part of your, but it's not part of my business model, so it's not aligned to my strategy. So it must be aligned to my strategy, number one. Number two, it should, should be accretive, should create shareholder value. So if, if the board came and told me, why don't we go buy this uh, thing, and you know what, it's going to be dilutive for the next five years, but uh, so what, I won't do it, right? Because it's got to create shareholder value. Third, we've got to be intrinsically capable 
of integrating and bringing value to the acquisition. So which means either revenue synergies or cost synergies, but we must know that we have the wherewithal to drive value creation. If we cannot drive value creation, then you know just aggregating and putting it from moving it from one shareholder to another shareholder, there's no fun in that game, right? Now if all those three conditions work, which means that there's an opportunity which is priced right, so we can create value, it's accretive, then sure, why not? Well, even as you appear to be very organically driven, uh, a number of your peers are becoming regional and have put a lot of uh, money up front to, to try and build regionalization. I mean, in, in Malaysia, for example, you've got uh, CIMB, Maybank, uh, that have become regional in a way. Um, and it's, there's, there's no reason why it's not that DBS would not grow substantially, but a number of your peers would sort of catch up to where you are. Um, how do you look at your peers, at, uh, at so-called regional banks in, in, the, in the region? You know, we're very uniquely positioned. When you think about all the regional banks in Asia, all the Asian banks, right? All the North Asian banks have a North Asian footprint. The Koreans, the Taiwanese, the Chinese, the Hong Kong, they only operate in Greater China. All the Indian subcontinent banks are Indian plays. ICIC Bank, HDFC Bank, SBI, the fundamentally Indian plays, right? The couple of banks you mentioned here are two, three countries in ASEAN. There is only one bank in the Asian diaspora today who is well represented in all the three broad axes of growth in Asia. Asia. And that's us. We have a strong Indian position. We will soon be the fourth largest foreign bank in uh, India. It is the third largest business in our group. So it's a strong uh, Indian position. We have a strong Greater China position that I told you anchored off Hong Kong. We have a strong anchor position out of Singapore. There are very few people who are positioned to play the Asian integration game as well as we are. So we're really fundamentally distinguished from many of our uh, Asian competitors. But then you, you do have an ANZ, for example, which has sort of become a pan-Asian uh, institution. So what is your sense of an ANZ? Well, ANZ is not different from Standchart or HSBC or City. So they're, they're three and a half, let's say, global banks who are pan-Asian institutions. And there's two. The pan-Asian presence is very good. Where we can compete differently from them is the depth of our business. So most of the global players, while they have the breadth, they suffer from two handicaps. One, they don't go deep in the markets. They tend to be top-end banks, right? Whereas we have the underwriting skills, capacity, and frankly, risk appetite to go much deeper in the markets in which we operate, almost like a local bank. The second differentiator is most of the global banks tend to run product-centric businesses. They run down product chains. There'll be a fixed income business and equity business and so on and so forth. Uh, not customer-centric. We genuinely run a customer-centric business because we value a customer relationship as a relationship. What that means in practical terms is we're prepared to do loss-making businesses with customers provided the relationship on a whole is profitable to us. But you try doing that with a global bank, the fixed income guy won't do a deal if he's not making money and neither will the equities guy or the GTS guy. It's a very different model. Yeah, in fact, you've spoken about this in the past in terms of being the bank that sort of connects the dots in, in terms of pan-Asian um, um, trade, for, for example. Where are you with that? I mean, you know, the intention is there, but um, in terms of translating that into reality, what are you learning in terms of what's happening in Asia? Actually, we are actually making very good progress. And, and I think we can make a lot better progress, and I'll tell you why uh, there's some gaps in where we are. We're making good progress because if you look at where we're gaining traction, it is with the Asian, uh, new Asian MNCs, the Asian multinationals going uh, uh, overseas. And that actually uh, includes some middle market names as well. So in China, it's the Chinese companies coming out into the region that we are making a maximum progress with. We doubled the number of customers we have in China who are coming out and doubled our revenue base and this thing from those customers. Similarly, the Taiwanese going into China, the Indians going into Indonesia, the Singaporeans going around the, the region. That's our natural customer base. And last year, a large part of the traction we had on our institutional banking business really came from pursuing this customer base around the region. Final question, being the consumer commercial banker, who's probably one of the few left who's going to be building his business organically uh, first, um, what is your sense of what's happening globally in terms of um, some of the new regulations coming out of the US, for example, in UK, with all of these restrictions coming on board, is it fun being a commercial banker? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love banking. And I think there's as much opportunity in banking going forward as there's uh, ever been. Into, you know, at the end of the day, banks have two or three fundamental roles. We intermediate risk, we intermediate uh, liquidity, we intermediate maturities. 
right? you need somebody to do that role it doesn't uh, disappear or change right so it's a uh, and the fact that you know the 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 rules are changing I, some of those rules are owed you to change but that's something you live with and you work with right in our context remember the big things that are changing which have impacted a lot of the global banks in fact the walker rules and frank dot is prop trading uh, the prop trading and the straight this thing is not a large component of the business for a large number of asian banks including ourselves so it doesn't materially impact what we do what does impact us is really basel related stuff which is capital and liquidity right fortunately all the asian banks were well ahead of the game in terms of capital and so while we have to be cautious about capital but it's, you know we don't have huge capital catch up to do in fact we believe we are already ahead of basel 3 requirements today uh, liquidity is the one thing that we all got to watch out for now the liquidity guidelines are still moving around uh, but that is something that might be a uh, uh, a change that will give us food for thought piyush gupta thank you very much i thought pleasure pleasure talking to you